Chapter Twenty One of the Tower Treasure by Franklin W. Dixon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A new idea. A week passed, and still the loot was not recovered. Mr. Robinson had been held for trial at an early court session. The general opinion in Bayport was that he would be sentenced to imprisonment. The fact that he still refused to tell where he had got the nine hundred dollars so near the time of the robbery weighed heavily against him. Fenton Hardy was downcast. It was the first case of its kind that he had been unsuccessful in solving completely, and although he was satisfied that he had done good work in tracking down Red Jackley and getting the confession, the result had scarcely been worth the effort. Chief Collig and Detective Smuff were complacent. They made no effort to conceal their critical opinions of the great detective, who had taken so much time trying to solve the mystery, when the real thief was right under his nose all the time. "'I told you so,' was the burden of Chief Colleague's song of triumph. "'I knew all the time that Robinson was the man. I arrested him right after the robbery, but they all said it couldn't be him, so I let him go. But I knew all the time it couldn't be anyone else.' Ain't that so, Smuff? And the loyal Smuff would dutifully chime in with, Yes, Chief, we have to hand it to you. You had the right man all the time. I guess these professional detectives won't think they're so smart after all, eh, Smuff? No, you bet they won't. We can still teach them a thing or two. I'll say we can, Smuff. I'll say we can. These stories, naturally enough, reached the ears of Fenton Hardy and the Hardy Boys, and they felt keenly the arrogant superiority displayed by the Bayport police officials. But they said nothing, suffering their defeat in silence. On the following Saturday, Frank and Joe decided to take an outing. "'I want to get out of this city for a few hours,' said Frank. "'We've been so busy worrying about the Tower Mansion case that we've forgotten how to play. Let's take the motorbikes and go out for a run.' "'Good idea,' his brother replied. "'Mother will make us up some lunch.' Mrs. Hardy, who was in the kitchen with the cook, smiled when they made known their request. Fair-haired and gentle, she had been tolerantly amused by her son's activities in the tower affair, but she was glad to see them return to their boyish ways. "'You'll be getting too grown up altogether,' she had said to them a few days previously." and now when they said they were going on a day's outing with the motorcycles she hastened to prepare a substantial lunch for them we'll be back in time for supper mother frank promised we're just going to follow the highway along the railroad after that we may cut across country to chet's place and then home take care of yourself she warned no speeding we'll be careful they promised as joe stowed the lunch basket on the carrier of his machine then, with a sputtering roar, the motorcycle sped out along the driveway, and soon the boys were on the concrete highway leading out of the city. In a short time they had reached the outskirts of Bayport, and then they turned west onto the state highway that ran parallel to the railway tracks. It was a bright, sunny spring morning, and the highway was not congested with traffic. Freight trains shunted back and forth on the railway tracks below the embankment, and now and then a passenger train steamed by, trailing a cloud of black smoke. Like most boys, Frank and Joe could not help but feel the fascination of the railway, although they admitted that they preferred the comparative freedom of their own motorcycles, which were not bound to follow the steel rails, and did not have to obey the beck and call of dispatchers. Out in the open country, they put on a little more speed. The highway was like a city pavement beneath them, and the cool breeze stung the color into their cheeks. For more than two hours they rode, passing through villages and small towns, until at last they came to a point where another railway intersected the line they had been following. Here, a road also ran parallel to the tracks, branching off the main highway. Always on the alert for new country to explore, the Hardy Boys decided to follow the side road. "'It's off the main stream of traffic,' said Frank, "'and the country seems to be wooded farther on. We can have lunch in the shade of some trees.' This appeared to be an advantage, for there were no trees along the state road, and the constant stream of vehicles made a roadside lunch something of a public affair. 
Accordingly, the boys turned their motorcycles down the side road, which, although it was not paved, was well graded, and led through a quieter countryside. "'What railroad is this, anyway?' asked Frank as they sped along. "'The Bayport and Coast Line. It's mostly freight.' "'The Bayport and Coast? Why, that's the railway that Red Jackley used to work for. Don't you remember Dad telling us that? His first crime was stealing freight from the road.' "'So he did. I'd forgotten all about it.' The boys looked down at the tracks below the embankment with renewed interest by virtue of the railway's association with the notorious criminal. Mention of Jackley's name revived recollections of the Tower Mansion case, and when the boys finally decided to stop in the shade of a little grove of trees beside the road for lunch, they reviewed every incident of the mysterious affair. It would have been better for everyone if Jackley had stayed with the railway, Frank observed as he bit into a thick roast beef sandwich. He sure caused a lot of trouble before he died. And he has caused even more sense by looks of things. The Robinsons will remember his name for a long time to come. I wonder if Mr. Robinson really was in league with him, Frank. I don't think so, and I don't believe Mr. Robinson ever found that treasure after the robbery either. There is some explanation to this whole affair that none has been able to fathom. If I remember rightly, it was in this part of the country that Jack Lee worked. That's what Dad told us. He said it was along the right-of-way near the state road. Jack Lee was a section hand or a signalman or something. Both boys gazed down the two lines of railway tracks that gleamed in the sun. Far into the distance, the glittering bands of steel extended, vanishing into a common perspective. The land along the right-of-way was thickly wooded. It was an attractive part of the country, and here and there the wooded spaces were broken by green fields and meadows. The boys were at the top of a slope, and they had a view of a wide expanse of country beneath them. In the far distance along the tracks, they could see a little red railway station, and back of that the roofs and spires of a village. Nearer still they could see the spindly legs and squat bulk of a water tank, painted a bright scarlet. This water tank was not far from the railway station, but half a mile down the track, and only a few hundred yards from the place where the Hardy Boys were seated, rose the bulk of another water tower. But this tower, one of the old style built before the modern tanks came into use, was not freshly painted. It had been allowed to fall into a state of disrepair. Some of the rungs were missing from the ladder that led up the side, and the tower itself had a forlorn and weather-beaten aspect, as though it had been deserted. This indeed was the case. The new tower tank closer to the station had been erected to replace it, and although the old structure had not been torn down, it was not now used. Frank took a huge bite out of his sandwich and began to munch it thoughtfully. The sight of the two water stations had given him an idea, but at first it seemed to him to be too absurd for consideration. He was wondering whether he should mention it to his brother. Then he noticed that Joe, too, was gazing thoughtfully down the railway tracks. Joe raised a sandwich to his lips absently, essayed a bite, and missed the sandwich altogether. Still, he continued gazing at the two water towers. Finally, Joe turned and looked at his brother. In the eyes of both was the light of a great discovery. They knew that they were both thinking of the same thing. Two water towers, said Frank slowly. An old one and a new one. And Jack Lee said, he hid the stuff in the old tower. He was a railway man. Why not? shouted Joe, springing to his feet. Why couldn't it have been the old water tower? He used to work around here. He didn't say the old tower of Tower Mansion, after all. He just said the old tower. Frank, I believe we stumbled on the clue. It would be the natural thing for him to come to his old haunts after the robbery, and if he found he couldn't get away with the stuff, he would hide it somewhere he knew, the old water tower. Why didn't we think of it before, Joe? Why, that must be the place. End of chapter 21《ハッピーバースデー》の2つの2つの2つの2つの2つの2つの2つの2つの2つの2つの2つの2つの2つの2つの2つの2つの2つの2つの2つの2つの2つの2つの2つの2つの2つの2つの2つの2つの2つの2つの2つの2つの2つの2つの2つの2つの2つの2つの2つの2つ
lunch, motorcycles, everything else was forgotten. With a wild yell of delight, Frank began to scurry down the embankment that flanked their right of way. At his heels ran Joe. They raced down the grassy slope until they came to the wire fence. They scrambled over it, heedless of tearing their clothes. They dashed up onto the cinder path beside the rails. "'What if we're wrong, Frank?' panted Joe. "'We can't be wrong. I just know that's what Jack Lee meant. The old tower. It was the old water tower he meant all along. He didn't have time to explain.' The Hardy Boys were tingling with excitement. It seemed that they could never reach the water tower. They dashed along the center path with all the speed at their command, but the tower still seemed a long distance away. If only we have stumbled on the secret after all, Joe. It'll clear Mr. Robinson. We'll get the reward. Dad'll be proud of us. These thoughts gave them new strength, and their hopes were high as they neared the tower. The structure reared gloomily from beside the tracks. At close quarters it was even more decrepit, even more in a state of disrepair than they had imagined. The old tower had been abandoned for some time in favor of the new tank nearer the station. It sagged perilously. The ladder that led to the top lacked so many rungs that at first the boys feared that they would be unable to ascend. If Jack Lee got up this ladder, we can do the same, said Frank as he stopped, panting at the bottom. Let's go. He began to scramble up the flimsy ladder. Hardly had he ascended four rungs than there came an alarming crack. Look out! Frank clung to the rung above, just as a rung snapped beneath his weight. He hung in midair for a moment, then drew up his feet and placed them on the next rung. This proved firmer, and he was able to go on. Don't break em all, called Joe. I want to be in on this. Frank continued up the ladder. Occasionally, when he came to a place where a rung had broken off, he was obliged to haul himself upward by main force, but finally he neared the top. The ladder ran up along the side of the tank to the very top of the great vat-like receptacle, and there it led to a trapdoor. The hardy boys did not look down. They were high above the ground now, and the old water tower was swaying alarmingly. They began to realize their peril, for the tower was old and liable to topple over with them. But the thought did not serve to restrain them, and at last Frank scrambled over the last rung and found himself on the upper surface of the tower. He turned around and helped Joe over. Far below them lay the countryside, the green fields laid out in neat patterns, the roads in the distance like white ribbons, and the railway tracks glistening in the sunlight. The wind seemed much stronger on top of the tower, and it whistled about their ears. The flimsy structure swayed to and fro with every movement they made. The trap door was closed. Frank went over to it and tugged at it, but the timber was heavy, and Joe was obliged to help him. Between the two, however, they managed to raise it, revealing a dark gap that led into the recesses of the abandoned water tower. The upper part of the tank was a space about four feet in depth, and separated from the lower, or main portion, by a thick floor. Frank lowered himself through the opening, and he was quickly followed by his brother. They crouched down below the roof of the tank and peered about them in the obscurity. "'It must be in here. There's no other place he could have hidden the stuff.' said Frank. Let's hunt for it, then. I wish we had brought our flashlights. Frank, however, had matches. Cautiously, he lit one. Then, crawling on hands and knees, he advanced into the darkness of the tower. In the faint glow of the match, they saw that the place was half filled with rubbish. There was a quantity of old lumber, miscellaneous bits of iron, battered tin pails, crowbars, and other things piled up pell-mell in all parts of the tower but there was no sign of hidden loot. "'It must be here somewhere,' declared Joe doggedly. "'He wouldn't leave it out in the open. Probably it's in behind all this junk.' Frank held the match. They had to be careful, for the place was as dry as tinder, and any negligence might have made the whole place a mass of flame from which there would have been no escape. In the glow, then, Joe searched frantically, casting the old pails and the old bits of board and lumber aside with reckless abandon. One entire side of the tower top was searched without result. Then, on the far side, they spied a number of boards piled up in a peculiar manner. 
They did not look as though they had been flung there carelessly or accidentally, but rather as though they had been placed to hide something. Like a terrier after a bone, Joe made for it. Frantically, he tore away the boards. There, in a neat little hiding place formed by the wood, lay a bag. It was an ordinary gunny sack, but when Joe dragged it forth, he knew at once that their search had ended. "'We've found it!' he exulted. "'The tower treasure! This must be it!' Joe dragged the gunny sack out into the light beneath the trapdoor. They did not even wait to go out on top of the water tower. "'Hurry!' exclaimed Frank, as with trembling fingers Joe began to open the sack. It was tied with a piece of twine, and Joe tugged at the stubborn knots. At last, however, the twine fell away, and the bag sagged open. Joe plunged his hand into the recesses of the sack, and he first withdrew an old-fashioned bracelet of precious stones. Jewelry! How about the bonds? Again, Joe groped into the sack. His fingers encountered a bulky packet. He withdrew it, and the packet proved to be comprised of long, imposing-looking documents held together by a rubber band. On the surface of the outer document, when they held it up to the light, they read the information that it was a negotiable bond for $5,000 issued by the city of Bayport. "'That settles it,' said Frank. "'We've found the treasure.' The boys looked at one another in triumph. Jackley wasn't lying after all. He did hide the stuff in the old tower, and Mr. Robinson wasn't in league with him and didn't find it after it was hidden, ruminated Joe. We can clear up the whole affair now. Let's start, then, Frank exclaimed. No use sitting here all day patting ourselves on the back. It's up to us to get right back to Bayport and turn this treasure over to the Applegates. Hastily, he scrambled up through the trap, and Joe passed the bag of treasure up to him. Frank put the sack carefully to one side, then helped his brother up to the top of the tower. After that, he tied the treasure sack to his belt, in order that he might have the full use of his two hands in descending the precarious ladder. They were so excited by their momentous discovery, and by the knowledge that all the days of fruitless search had now ended, that they descended the ladder at breakneck speed. The last two rungs of the ladder snapped under Frank's feet, and the boys were obliged to undertake a drop of six feet in order to reach the ground, but they hardly noticed it. Scarcely had they picked themselves up than they were off on a run for their motorcycles, parked far back on the hillside. "'We've shown them, eh?' gasped Joe. "'I'll say we have. Oh, boy, won't this surprise everybody?' "'Now I'd like to see Dad tell us we're not cut out to be detectives.' Wait till Adelia Applegate sees all her jewelry back again. She'll change her opinion of us. Wait till Herd Applegate sees his bonds back. And wait till Chief Colleg and Detective Smuff hear about it. So the Hardy Boys gloated over their prospective return, but beneath it all they were thinking of what this discovery meant to the Robinsons. They reached the embankment, scrambled over the fence, and made their way up the slope until at last they regained their motorcycles. Although they had only partly finished their lunch, they were too excited to eat any more, so they stowed the remainder away in the basket, lashed the bag of treasure securely to Frank's carrier, and turned the motorcycles around. "'What a lucky chance for us that we decided to go down this road,' declared Frank. "'If we had done as we intended and circled around by Chet's place, we would have never found the stuff.' "'And it's ten chances to one that neither of us would have thought of that water tower until his dying day.' The rest of their speculations were drowned by the roar of the motorcycles as the Hardy Boys set out on their return to Bayport with the Tower Treasure. End of chapter 22「Chapter 23 of The Tower Treasure by Franklin W. Dixon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Adelia Applegate's Compliment The curtain rolled down on the mystery of the tower treasure that afternoon in the library of the Applegate home. The Hardy Boys had gone directly to their father with the story of the recovery of the loot, and Fenton Hardy had lost no time in acquainting Herd Applegate with the facts. Between them they arranged a little surprise for Chief Colleg and Detective Smuff, as well as for Henry Robinson. On the invitation of Herd Applegate, the chief brought Mr. Robinson to Tower Mansion to be faced with additional evidence, as Fenton Hardy suavely put it. 
Chief Collig and Detective Smuff entered the library with their prisoner between them. They had confidently anticipated that Mr. Applegate had discovered some new facts that would further serve to tighten the web about the unfortunate caretaker, and when they came into the room there was nothing at first to eradicate this impression. Herd Applegate and Adelia Applegate sat by the huge library table, and with them were Mr. Hardy and his sons. Chief Collig did not at first notice the gunny sack lying on the table. "'Well, Mr. Applegate,' said the chief, fanning himself, as usual, with his hat, "'I brought along Mr. Robinson, just as you asked.' "'Good. As I mentioned to you, there has been some new evidence in this case.' "'I knew something would turn up,' grunted Smuff. "'Not that any new evidence is needed, of course,' declared the chief. "'We got this fellow dead to rights as it is. He ain't got a chance in the world. But still, it's just as good to make a real strong case of it.' "'I'm afraid you don't understand me,' went on Herd Applegate. "'This new evidence will clear Mr. Robinson. And when he is cleared, I want him back in my employ again.' "'Huh?' gasped Chief Collig. "'What's that you say?' exclaimed Smuff. "'The stolen stuff has been found. "'No!' "'Here it is,' put in Fenton Hardy, getting up and dumping the gunny sack upside down on the table. There was a tinkle and clatter as jewels came rolling out on the table, and then there was a rustle of paper as the packets of bonds followed. "'Where was it found?' asked the chief. "'This doesn't clear him. He probably hid it some place.' "'The stuff was found just where Jack Lee said he hid it, in the old tower. "'But the old tower was searched high and low.' "'There's more than one old tower,' went on Mr. Hardy, "'only we didn't have to think of that at the time. "'It was found in the old water tower down at the junction where Jack Lee used to work.' "'Chief Collig was speechless with surprise. "'He gazed at Smuff, whose jaw had dropped in astonishment. "'Who found it?' asked Smuff at last. "'These two lads,' said Mr. Applegate, indicating the Hardy boys, "'they found it this morning.' "'Them kids!' scoffed Chief Collig. "'I don't believe it.' "'Well, there's the stuff to prove it,' snapped Fenton Hardy. "'I got my jewelry back, thanks to them,' declared Adelia Applegate shrilly. "'They were smarter than the whole pack of you. "'If it wasn't for them, the stuff would have never been found. "'And I was the one who didn't want to let them search the old tower "'and who spoke crossly to them. "'Why, they're real detectives, both of them.' In all the talk and excitement that followed the clearing up of the tower mystery, the Hardy boys received no compliment that they treasured so much as that remark of Adelia Applegate's. Well, said Chief Collig, scratching his head, I'll be bumped. He looked at Smuff. I'll be bumped too, declared Smuff. This beats all, said the Chief. It does, agreed his faithful satellite. Shut up, snapped the Chief. Who asked you to say anything? Nobody? Only keep quiet. A fine detective you are. Why didn't you think of that? The old tower. Of course he meant the old water tower. What else could he have meant? But you wouldn't think of it. Not in a hundred years. You wouldn't think of it. What kind of a detective are you anyway? Here was a case that was as simple as A, B, C, and you couldn't think of it. You let yourself be beat by a couple of boys. Smuff looked properly ashamed of himself, although it was plain that he was struggling with the temptation to ask the chief why he had not thought of the water tower too. But he stifled the impulse, and thereby doubtless saved the chief the trouble of dismissing him for impudence and insubordination. Yes, said Herd Applegate, the Hardy Boys recovered the treasure, and I think you will admit that Mr. Robinson is cleared. "'Personally, I am satisfied that he knew nothing whatever of the theft, "'and I want to apologize to him for any unjust suspicions I may have had. "'Mr. Robinson, will you let me shake your hand?' "'Trembling, Henry Robinson stepped forward. "'His face had been illuminated by a glow of incredulous hope "'from the moment he learned of the discovery of the loot. "'Am I really cleared?' he asked. "'I knew things looked bad against me all along. "'I hardly dared hope.' "'I guess you'll be let off now, all right,' said Chief Collig grudgingly. "'There will be formalities, of course,' said Fenton Hardy, "'but I'm pretty sure the prosecution won't continue. "'The discovery of this loot proves Red Jackley's story was correct from start to finish.' "'But how about that nine hundred dollars?' demanded Smuff suspiciously. "'Mr. Robinson straightened up. "'I'm sorry,' 
he said, but even yet I can't explain that. I can in a few days, perhaps, but I've promised to keep silent about that money. It's a private matter entirely. I don't think we need to bother about that, objected Herd Applegate. I've checked over the treasure and it's all there, all the bonds and all the jewelry. There's nothing missing. As for the nine hundred dollars, why, that is Mr. Robinson's own affair. Reluctantly, Smuff subsided into silence. Will you come back into my employ, Mr. Robinson? asked Herd Applegate. Of course, I feel very keenly because you are unjustly accused, and I want to make it up to you. If you will consent to come back to Tower Mansion as a caretaker again, I will increase your salary, and I'll also insist that you accept back pay for the time you were away. What? stammered Robinson. This is good of you, Mr. Applegate. Of course I'll come back. I'll be glad to. It'll mean a lot to my wife and daughters, and to Perry. He'll be able to go back to school again. Good! exclaimed Joe Hardy impulsively, slapping his knee. Then, finding that he had attracted attention to himself, he sank back into his chair, embarrassed. "'And as for the Hardy boys,' proceeded Herd Applegate, seeing they discovered the treasure. "'Real detectives!' shrilled Adelia. "'Real detectives, both of them! Smart lads!' "'Yes, they showed some real detective work, and I hope they grow up to follow in their father's footsteps. But as I was saying, they discovered the treasure, so of course they will get the reward.' "'A thousand bucks!' exclaimed Detective Smuff in awe. "'Dollars, Mr. Smuff, dollars!' corrected Adelia Applegate severely. "'No slang, please, not in Tower Mansion.' "'One thousand iron men!' declared Smuff unheeding. "'One thousand round, fat, juicy smackers for a couple of kids, and a real detective like me!' The thought was too much for him. He sank his head in his hands and groaned aloud. Frank and Joe did not dare look at each other. They were finding it difficult enough to restrain their laughter without that. "'Yes, a thousand dollars,' went on Herd Applegate. "'I'll write the checks now. Five hundred for each.' With that, he took out his fountain pen, reached in a drawer of the table for a checkbook, and soon the silence was broken by the scratching of pen on paper. Herd Applegate wrote out two checks, each for five hundred dollars, and these he handed to the boys. Frank and Joe accepted them with thanks, folded them up, and put them in their pockets. And that, I think, concluded Mr. Applegate, finishes the mystery of the tower robbery. Thanks to the Hardy boys, chimed in his sister. Real detectives, both of them. I must ask them up for supper some night. End of chapter 23《Chapter 24 of The Tower Treasure》by Franklin W. Dixon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Last of the Tower Case The discovery of the Tower Mansion treasure was a Bayport sensation for almost a week, and a week is a long time for any sensation to last, even in Bayport. People said that they knew all along that Mr. Robinson was innocent of the theft, and went as far out of their way to be nice to him as they had gone out of their way to be unkind to him and ignore him when he was accused of crime. People, too, were loud in their praises of the Hardy Boys, and everybody predicted a bright future for them and said they knew all along that the lads were bound to solve the mystery if they kept at it long enough. All of this the boys took with a grain of salt, as the saying is, for they knew that the public is fickle, and as quick to condemn failure as it is to praise success. Frank and Joe did not let the adulation turn their heads. When we couldn't find the treasure, everybody said we were just nuisances, little boys trying to play detective, laughed Frank. Now that we have found it, all that is forgotten. The main thing is that we've proved to Dad that we know how to keep our eyes and ears open. And we've got a thousand dollars between us. A mighty nice start for a bank account. I'll say it is. I wish another mystery would come along. We can't expect to get a reward for every case we work on. And we can't expect to solve them all either, Frank pointed out. We can't expect to get many cases to try our hand at. We're not professionals just yet. No, but we will be some day. This conversation took place as the Hardy Boys were on their way up to Tower Mansion about a week later. 
Adelia Applegate, who had taken a great fancy to the lads, in violent contrast to her dislike of them on the day they had gone to make a search of the old tower, had invited them up to Tower Mansion for supper. She had also asked them to invite a number of their chums. So Slim Robinson, Chet Morton, Biff Hooper, Jerry Gilroy, Phil Cohen, and Tony Preto had all been invited by the brothers to attend. When the Hardy boys reached the mansion, they found that the others had already arrived. "'We're waiting for you!' shrilled Miss Applegate, who was decked out in an ancient yellow gown with remarkable trimmings of black and red. "'Everybody's hungry!' She soon led the way to the dining room, where a long table had been prepared for the boys. They gasped when they saw that array, and Miss Applegate beamed. "'I know you don't an old woman like me watching you while you eat,' she cried. "'So go right ahead, and put your elbows on the table if you wish.' There was a scramble for places as a servant came in with the soup, but Frank Hardy sprang to his feet. Three cheers for Miss Applegate!' They were given with vociferous enthusiasm. Miss Applegate blushed with pleasure, and as she left the room, the Hardy boys and their chums were sitting down to a banquet the like of which they had never seen before. For more than half an hour they indulged in roast chicken, crisp and brown, huge helpings of fluffy mashed potatoes, pickles, vegetables and salads, pies and puddings to suit every taste, and when the last boy sank back in his chair with a happy sigh, there was still food to spare. I never thought I'd see the day when I'd quit eating while there was still some chicken on the table, murmured Chet Morton, but this is the day. We have the Hardy Boys to thank for this spread, said Jerry. Let's give them three cheers. The boys roared out their hip, hip, hurrah three times, while Joe and Frank looked acutely uncomfortable. They looked still more uncomfortable when Slim Robinson got up, pushing back his chair. I'd like to say something, fellows, if you don't mind. Three cheers for Slim, yelled someone. So the boys gave Slim three cheers, and he gulped and blushed crimson. Speech! The cry was taken up. Speech! Speech! I'm not going to make any speech, he said. I only want to say something. Go ahead! I'm not going to hand out any compliments to the Hardy Boys. Joe and Frank looked greatly relieved. They had been afraid of being embarrassed by Slim's gratitude. Everybody knows what they've done, and everybody knows what it means to me and my family. You bet. Sure. But I just want to clear up one point on behalf of my father. Three cheers for Henry Robinson. He's all right. The three cheers for Mr. Robinson were perhaps a little weaker than the others, but that was only because some of the boys were beginning to show slight signs of hoarseness by that time. It's about the nine hundred dollars that he got just about the time of the robbery. He couldn't explain it at the time, and it looked bad against him. It doesn't matter where he got it, shouted Biff Hooper. I'll bet he got it honestly anyway, and if anyone else says different, just let him come outside. No one else said differently. Yes, he got it honestly, of course, said Slim. The money was paid by a man who owed it to him. But Dad couldn't say anything about it because he promised not to. This man owed two other men besides my father, and those debts should have been paid first. He was afraid the others would sue him if they heard he had paid Dad, so he made my father promise to say nothing. And when my dad makes a promise, he keeps it. The boys looked at one another. To tell the truth, few of them had thought of the affair of the nine hundred dollars, but now that it was recalled to them, they realized that here was the final angle of the Tower Mansion mystery cleared up at last. They cheered Slim to the echo, they pounded on the table with their knives, and when Herd Applegate came in to see what the racket was about, they gave him three cheers and made him sit at the head of the table. And that ended the affair of Tower Mansion, but it did not end the career of the Hardy Boys as amateur detectives. They were soon to be called on to help solve another mystery, and the story of their adventures in this case will be told in the next volume of this series, entitled The Hardy Boys, The House on the Cliff. Speech! Speech! the boys were shouting to Herd Applegate. The old stamp collector got up, smiling. It's been a long time since there's been a crowd of boys in Tower Mansion, he said. I've been in danger of forgetting that I was ever young once myself, so I want you to come back often. I want you to know that Tower Mansion is always open to the Hardy Boys and their chums. The Hardy Boys looked at one another as the crowd about the table broke into a yell of delight. 
"'He's a pretty good old scout, after all, isn't he?' said Frank. "'You bet he is,' replied his brother. The End of the Tower Treasure by Franklin W. Dixon